Um, I'm delighted to be here at my first SMAC conference. A little bit terrified, but here we go. Um, I'm going to talk about pre-hospital damage control resuscitation, how we do it in London, and a little bit about where the future might be going for us. So how big is the problem? Well, you probably all know that internationally, about 2 million patients every year bleed to death from trauma. And at a more local level, certainly within the NHS, about 6,000 trauma patients a year are defined as having major or massive hemorrhage. 30% of those patients will die. 50% of them die within the first four hours, and 50% of those needed emergency surgery. At a local level, we see these type of cases virtually every single shift, and on some occasions, more than one per shift. So to remind you of the traditional damage control resuscitation principles, they're slightly different for us in pre-hospital care, because whilst we're told to arrest hemorrhage immediately, we're aware that we can't always do that completely, and rarely can we actually get complete um, vascular control. So when we put on a tourniquet or put up a Reboa balloon or get manual aortic compression, these are temporizing measures. The resuscitation principles are that we should restore blood volume, but that's rarely to normal or um, normal physiology, and we're aiming for permissive hypotension. As we saw earlier, most services do not carry um, a wide range of blood products, so actually restoring blood volume with crystalloid is not ideal. Again, the principles tell us to correct coagulopathy, acidosis, and hypothermia. But really, in pre-hospital care, we can't even measure some of these things. But we can address them and consider them as part of our treatment. So in London, we have a paramedic in the control room 24 hours a day who is actively looking for the jobs, trying to dispatch us via air in the daytime to the patients that need us as soon as possible. We're covering 11 million people, and we can get to their side by air in about 15 minutes from the time of the call. Our team, currently a doctor and a paramedic working alongside the ambulance service and perhaps the fire brigade or police, carry a significant amount of kit. We believe in careful handling and packaging at all stages of patient care, and we carry drugs um, such as tranexamic acid, calcium, and bicarbonate. Um, we carry splints. We carry um, the usual adjuncts for hemorrhage control, blast bandages, C-LOX gauze. We have temperature control um, measures such as the blizzard blanket to maintain core temperature. We can give packed red blood cell transfusion. We can do thoracotomy, predominantly for penetrating trauma, but occasionally for blunt. And as you've seen this morning, we can perform zone three Reboa. So we have those skills and that kit in our bags. Code Red is something you've already heard a bit about this morning, but this was a care bundle, effectively, that we brought into London in 2008. It was really about getting the right resources available at the hospital for when we brought the patient in. So it was a pre-hospital alert system. So how has it worked? Well, initially, it was only introduced at the Royal London Hospital, so the HEMS teams could tell the hospital we were on our way with a patient who we believed was exsanguinating. On arrival, there'd be a massive hemorrhage protocol activated, and we would have senior decision makers and clinicians present. What you can see from this graph is that in 2007, the mortality rate for this group of patients was up near 60%. And with gradual stepwise improvements in process and in treatments, we brought that mortality rate down to just under 30%. That protocol has now been rolled out so that Code Red is activated at all London major trauma centres, and in fact, internationally, other centres have taken it on as well. And in 2012, we recognised that not having any type of blood product to resuscitate these patients was hindering us. So we launched packed red blood cells on board. People this morning have already been asking the question about um, where's the evidence for this, where's the randomised control trial. Um, we didn't do a randomised control because um, I think Wolfgang put it very nicely. There wasn't the evidence. Um, and we decided it felt like the right thing to do for patients. We've compared our data for the three years before that intervention with three years post-intervention. The pre-hospital mortality rate for this group was 34% leading up to 2012. And since then, it's come down to 18%. 
Now, it's not a randomized controlled trial. It doesn't equate to survival to discharge, but why would you expect it to equate to survival to discharge when it's actually one intervention that's delivered pre-hospital and the patient still has a very long journey to go? So who needs damage control resuscitation? Patients like Vicky, who you saw this morning, it's fairly obvious from her mechanism, her anatomical disruption, her physiology, that she is a prime candidate. And it's easy if you have an X-ray or a CT scan to tell you, but we don't have that luxury. And some patients, it's not as obvious as it was in Vicky's case. So often it's left to the clinicians, the doctors, the paramedics, using their clinical acumen, their previous experience, and their interpretation of the physiology and the mechanism to decide which patients need DCR. The next decision is when should we intervene and where? As I've said, we've got a lot of kit, we have skills, but when is the appropriate time to do it? And again, this comes down to our judgment on most occasions. But the good news is there is some more technology which may help us. Um, a very clever US military physiologist called Victor Convertino has actually um, developed this device over the last 20 years. And it measures something called your compensatory reserve index. It's based on the pulse oximetry probe. And as you can see, it can be monitored on a handheld device. And it can, um, several devices can be streamed to a tablet. What this device does is within 30 heartbeats of being on the patient's finger, it analyzes your arterial waveform, which actually takes into effect all of your compensatory mechanisms. It compares it to other um, algorithms and modeling inside the device, which has looked at hundreds of patients in different phases of hypovolemic shock. And it gives you an estimate of their amount of reserve. So it can tell you how much tolerance your patient has. And perhaps it's very simple, it's a color indicator, red being critical, orange being um, borderline, and green being fine. It may allow you to decide where you intervene. We have other near pa patient testing devices which may help, the iStat to give you lactate or base deficit. The coagu check on the right hand side can help you decide to reverse someone's warfarin if they're in extremis. Rotan would be brilliant if we, we know that 25% of our patients have ATC when we're at scene treating them, but how good would it be that we could actually ring the major trauma center and say, they've got ATC, this is what their trace looks like, this is what they need. However, until that machine gets an awful lot smaller, it's not gonna happen. When we're deciding whether to do zone one or zone three Reboa, that's a big decision to make as well. And deciding where to intervene is going to be critical. Do we have the best tools for the job? We've already heard this morning that fibrinogen is really important. Whether it's cryoprecipitate, fibrinogen concentrate, we now know that platelets work better at four degrees than they do at room temperature. So we could do with all of these products available pre-hospital. But actually, do we have time to give two, three, or four different bags? What we really need is a product that has everything in it. If you put whole blood through a filter, it actually re it removes the platelets at the moment, but there is a filter coming in which has actually preserved the platelets. And we hope by the end of this year in London, we will be carrying whole blood initially with platelet depleted, but hopefully later on, maybe in 18 months, with platelet replete whole blood. Um, our heating devices, they need to be improved and we're just trialing a new one. But our biggest problem at the moment is we have a two-man team they have multiple things to do on scene, and sometimes it's only the doctor that's able to deliver all of the critical interventions. So recently, we've appointed another 11 consultants who will provide additional teaching and training, clinical decision-making, better competency, competency for rare procedures such as Reboa, and we hope we'll shorten our pre-hospital times for our damage control patients. So these are the things we'll be doing over the next couple of years, um, and hopefully we'll have some good results. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. That was really interesting. Uh, are there questions from the Twittersphere? Yeah, we have some questions uh, related to Raboa. So Luke Reagan, our uh, resident <coughs> ultrasonographer, asks, how many, if any, of the 19 patients given pre- or peri-hospital Raboa turned out not to have bleeding injury distal to the balloon? Distal to the balloon. Um, I think all we've had a couple of patients who haven't actually had a. Um, it wasn't a traumatic injury. We've had one intravenous drug abuser who actually had a femoral artery aneurysm which burst, um, but was complicated by the presentation on scene. 
Um, but actually, all of the patients that we have had injuries distal to the balloon, some have obviously had injuries above the balloon as well. As Claire said before, we're doing zone three, not zone one Reboa currently. Um, but they have all had injuries. And then Hawkmoon Hems asks a follow-up question. Do you use ultrasound or EFAS to diagnose free fluid in the abdomen and then decide to go to zone one, zone three, et cetera, in London? So at the moment, we're only using ultrasound for the vascular access for Reboa. We do carry um, a sonocyte Nanomax. In the past, we've used it for looking at lung windows to decide if a patient had a pneumothorax. We're not currently using it for EFAST, but I suspect that is one of the things we might use in the future. But we're just becoming very aware of extending pre-hospital times, and the more we do, the longer it takes. And you talked about using whole blood in the field for resuscitation. Are they currently using that in your trauma center? No, they're not. So um, the National Health Service Blood and Transfusion um, Service don't actually produce whole blood as such at the moment. So that's, we're working on that project with them. They're going to create the actual product for us. Um, and then it will be used as part of a trial. It won't be a randomized controlled trial, but effectively it will be a feasibility study. And you have much wastage of blood. No, we've got an amazing system. We hardly have, we've wasted, we do about 100 transfusions a year pre-hospital. Um, and currently, um, we've only wasted one unit of blood and that was due to communication issues with the lab. But the system we have, I think many people are using is the golden hour box where you have temperature loggers. The blood can actually stay in that box for up to 72 hours. Um, but actually we change it every 24 hours. It goes back into the main hospital lab and is, is recirculated. Fantastic, and thank you very much for sharing the London Hems experience. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat>